in the longer run. Now we look only due to the title of the lecture to the last four to five years. This means we look at the labor market policy in that time. We will see that there is a strong policy in the EU member states and uh, as usual I will end with some conclusions what does that mean. Let us have a first look at the development of uh, the economic growth over the last years and of the employment. The economic growth, the green one, you see uh, something which didn't happen since World War II. A sharp decline all over the EU 27 of minus 5%. <coughs> That's nothing which can happen sometimes. That's very unique all over the world. And uh, what had happened again was a rather sharp increase afterwards. And the, the good, the positive message is the labor markets uh, react in a very calm way for all the European states. It differs from land to land, from country to country. You see uh, that it takes time that the labor market react to an economic decline and it, it reacts only very calm with uh, about minus 2% and then it goes back and we have here a slight uh, growing of uh, uh, employment in the last two years. The interesting thing is then to look why is it so and how it differs between the countries. What we have here is a chart finding rate, the green one, and the chart separation is the um, yellow one and the uh, kind of difference of this of the unemployment rate in the years 2000, 2001 to 2011. And we see that the unemployment rate in the Euro area uh, goes back till 2008 and then it comes to the uh, growth of it uh, at about 11%. And uh, what was happened was uh, that job finding uh, went back over the beginning of the crisis, 2009, 2010, and then uh, is on that level which is not very high due to the time before the crisis. And on the other side you have those job separation rate, the jobs diminish. What is job separation? What does it mean? It's a separation from a uh, working place to uh, workers. Ah. <coughs> and it, uh, that, that means people lost their job. And uh, it's the highest at uh, 2009, with about uh, um, 1%. What you will see very often is a comparison between different areas all over the world. And we have here the United States, that one, uh, the Euro area in blue, the European Union in yellow, and uh, the G7 
seven states in uh, green, and you see slightly different uh, development after uh, the beginning of the, the crisis before uh, you have between 2000, uh, summer 2008 and uh, spring of 2009 those uh, increasing it's rather sharp in the US uh, in the United States and it's uh, modest in the EU but uh, now it uh, then you have about three years, two years, um, you can say it's rather stable. And it, uh, it's true for the G7 at the uh, moment. In the United States, you have a uh, declining unemployment rate. And in the European Union or the Euro area, you have a further increase. Now, let's uh, excuse to the um, new crisis, if you want so to a public debt crisis, even in the um, southern Europe, uh, European countries here. Um, a greater problem for all countries is the unemployment rate is the unemployment rate for people who are unemployed for more than one year. They are the so-called long-term unemployed. They're, they lose contact to the labor markets, to the demand for labor, and they lose their own human capital in this time. So it gets harder uh, to, to find a new job. So uh, we have, if we, uh, if we want to see how good labor markets work, it is um, most of the times better to look at the long-term unemployment than to look at the unemployment at all. And uh, here we have a, a very, uh, on the one hand, a, a rather typical development, on, on the other hand, a uh, very new development uh, for the United States. A strong growth of the long-term unemployment and uh, a non-decrease of uh, the long-term uh, unemployment after uh, the economic recovery. Now that's a, a, a very new situation. If you look over the last 40, 50 years on the uh, American unemployment rate, it uh, will change with the economic development. What's not the case in Europe? In Europe, you have a totally uh, other development of the unemployment rate. So this is a very new situation for the American people and for the American policy which has uh, only a few instruments to cope with long-term unemployment. The normal way to avoid long-term unemployment in the United States is uh, to give the people no more money so that they will go in the labor market whatever they earn and whatever job they will get. Now that is, uh, that has worked for many years, but not at the moment. Um, there's only a slight difference between the EU as a whole and the Euro area, and it's uh, the same direction. So this is one of those fine slides economic, economists love. You see nothing. <laughs> and, but we have time, so it's no problem. <coughs> you have, uh, perhaps we go to the right end of this picture. Uh, this is Austria, and we have four columns per country. 2008 and 2011, 
and with the unemployment rate in these countries, uh, which is a little bit special because of um, the ages, 15 to 74. Um, if you have, if you remember the discussion in all the EU member countries that the retirement age uh, should go up from 65 to 67 or so, or in Denmark, I think, to 70, uh, 74 is uh, rather high um, for that year. And uh, the countries are ranked due to the um, labor market um, success, if you think about You have Austria with the um, a very low unemployment rate, about 5%, and only on 1.5% you have uh, Estonia, with uh, now 22-23% um, in 2011. And we have uh, Poland here, with uh, slightly more than uh, the average of the EU 27, now about uh, 11, 12 percent in uh, Germany here, this uh, mm -hmm. a development which means uh, at first it, you have a very, a very, very calm decrease due to the beginning of the crisis, 2008 to 2009, which is in other countries much stronger look at Denmark. Denmark, one of the um, role models for a good uh, labor market policy is in the Euro area and in the European Union as a whole. That's a big difference between Denmark here and in Germany here. And uh, the second point is the unemployment decline uh, since 2009, which happened not so often here uh, in the other countries. And another interesting point perhaps I began with, uh, with Austria. Austria is as successful as the Netherlands. Uh, Luxembourg is perhaps not a really good model in that way because of the structure of employment there. Uh, many people talk about the Netherlands, many talk about Denmark, at the moment many talk about Germany, but nobody knows that there is a country <coughs> called Austria with a very, very good labor market uh, performance over the last 20 to 30 years. That's pity and I don't know why. I think I have no idea why it is so. But it's not uh, an unusual case that uh, Austria is uh, the best in that uh, picture. That's uh, rather normal over the years. So I take another uh, form of uh, bringing you this employment development uh, to see. Uh, here we have three years uh, in that direction and not in that one. And it's the picture before. It's a typical picture from the uh, OECD. Uh, in, now, this year is from the European Jobs Monitor, uh, but the OECD is uh, making that in a, uh, in a um, similar way, and uh, we saw before the uh, development of the unemployment, here we see the development of the employment rates, how many people of the working population are in work. And uh, we have, well, Sweden is not a good idea, we take Malta, Malta, a country of which we usually uh, don't speak very often in, in that way. 
perhaps in terms of holy days, but not in terms of unemployment. You see, at the, the beginning of the crisis, because in the summer of 2008, and I have about 60% of the labor force in work, um, it goes up to about 62 in 2011 and is now about 63. Um, this is a very good development. Uh, the other way around, you could see um, a, um, sorry, it's no good country because I forgot uh, the name of the country. <laughs> It's better to look at Estonia. You have the, you have the uh, opposite way coming from around 70% down to 60%. So that means over three years you have lost uh, 10 percentage points of the labor force in work. That's uh, dramatic for the country. And uh, you have other countries like uh, Sweden, where you have uh, no change over the crisis. And uh, you have the EU as uh, a small uh, decline. And you have Poland. Poland here was uh, no development at all. And uh, Germany here was an uprise in the labor market participant, participation. With these two pictures, you can see that the development all over the European uh, labor market is very, very different. You have both a decline and a decline in, in labor force participation seen as the employment rates and uh, seen as the unemployment rates. And, uh, <coughs> if I differ between employment rates and unemployment rates, uh, it reminds you that there is more than employment than official unemployment. You have a group of uh, the working force uh, which isn't in work, but is not official unemployed. That means they get no money from the state or another institution. They are um, gone from the labor market, and perhaps they will come back or not. That's what we, didn't, what we don't know uh, at the moment. Yes, here we don't need the whole picture. Uh, we can look at uh, this part here. Why I bring this uh, slide? Because of the short time work. Short time work is a very, very, very German instrument for labor in labor market policy. It means that people stay in the jobs but don't work full time and uh, they get from the employer only the money for the time they work and uh, the difference to the full-time uh, earning they get from the job center. That's a typical German instrument over the last 40 years. Um, um, Instead of people getting unemployed, they stay in the firms and uh, the employer and the employees get money from the federal uh, labor office. For how long? It depends on the kind of short-term work. You have different kinds of short-term work and in that case it was possible until um, two years. So, and uh, if you look uh, to that point, the peak in short-term work in this 
time between 2007 and 2010, in Germany it was 4.50% uh, of the labor force get short term jobs. Only in Japan it was a little bit higher, and in Belgium. And you see that many other countries uh, use these instruments. But uh, it was not uh, as successful as in Germany, and that's rather normal. It's a typical German instrument, which the German uh, labor uh, bureaucracy knows for many years. The employers know uh, the instrument, and the employees too. In other, the other countries saw about 2009 that uh, the Germans have a very um, unknown instrument which works very, very good in the crisis and uh, they um, take it with, within their own set of, of uh, instruments, labor market instruments but it doesn't work as good as in Germany because nobody knows this instrument. That's the first message if you want so. Good labor market in, or, the, or the other way around. Labor market instruments are good if the people know them. You find that in, in many uh, <coughs> parts of, of policy uh, another um, another uh, thing you have to, to see as finance minister is that old taxes are good taxes. That's the same. Yeah? If you need more money, then it's better to hire old taxes than to bring new taxes, which we have to, to accept, to understand, and so on. Yeah? Um, perhaps you look in your countries uh, <coughs> to what time and for what reason some taxes were initiated and uh, you will see that uh, the, the reasons for them are <coughs> gone but the taxes are still here and uh, we were paying them. Uh, in Germany you have uh, taxes on champagne and it was uh, introduced in 1914 to finance the, I missed the word, the fleet, flotte, no? the fleet of the um, emperor to that time, no? before, the, before World War the first. No? So if, uh, we have no World War, we have no emperor, we have only a little fleet in Germany. But we have the tax on champagne. That's, uh, that's rather typical uh, for, for instruments. If they work, it's good and we accept them. And it's the same with uh, labor market instruments. If you have them and they uh, work good, uh, it's okay for one country but not for the other who will take this uh, immediately. And uh, that's why I'm showing this uh, slide on short-term work. And uh, it's a uh, perhaps you know those um, categorization of countries in, in liberal, social democratic, and conservative countries due to Esping Andersen, a uh, Danish um, sociologist, I think, uh, in the beginning of the 90s. And uh, here you can see that uh, some instruments are very typical for uh, the one or the other group of countries, uh, whereas the other uh, the third group of countries doesn't know that instruments at all. And short time work is a very typical instrument for uh, the continental or conservative countries. And if you look here, you have Belgium, uh, in Germany, uh, Austria was not so strong in that way. France, it's not so clear whether it is a continental country or not in, in that categorization. So it's uh, a rather old and a rather crude uh, 
clustering of countries, but it works uh, over the time rather good. And you have uh, several new cluster ideas which came all to the same results. <laughs> That's a uh, uh, little bit uh, funny in that way. Blue and green again, and we have a change in total hours. I have to go here, so I will see it a little bit better. Uh, over the countries, and what we see here is uh, in green the change of employment, and in blue uh, the hours worked per employee. And now you can see the different reaction in the countries, uh, whether they change more the number of employees, that means the unemployment uh, rises, or they change uh, the hours worked per employee. You have here uh, Germany, Austria, Finland, Netherlands, Italy, France, uh, which were very successful in that way, um, and you have a stronger reaction in the decline of uh, hours worked per employee as in the um, number of em employees. And here you have on the other side uh, Spain and so on with a very strong increase of unemployment and uh, no reaction in, in the uh, hours work to employee. <coughs> so, over these two uh, indicators, number of employees and hours work, you can uh, uh, make a good difference in the reaction of uh, the European countries due to the crisis. And you can see that it's very different. Uh, and here, uh, the, the European <laughs> Union said that the older member states and then you see every combination you can afford of <coughs> So perhaps another uh, sentence to that. You can see um, something which wasn't planned by the European Union. One question? Yes. Yeah. That is <laughs> always a very good question, I have to say. <laughs> um, it means that you have a sharp de uh, decline in hours work and a very, very sharp increase in hours work. And um, <coughs> in, in the Czech Republic, you have uh, <coughs> a neuropathy strong automotive industry like uh, Volkswagen from Germany and so which produce in the Czech Republic and uh, and Skoda and so and uh, the, the economic increase after the first wave of the crisis was led by the automotive industry. So the Czech Republic is a very small economy and if there is a, a rather big part of it growing fast, then you could see that in that uh, picture. <coughs> I'm not quite sure, but it's <laughs> I think that will um, happen in the Czech Republic. <laughs> now, what I wanted to say before that question is, um, I mentioned this morning the European Employment Strategy. You see that uh, picture that uh, the member states of the 
European Monetary Union has no monetary policy, has only uh, restricted fiscal policy, but has a labor market policy, social policy within it and every country. So, and the European Union tries to influence the member states in the way they do labor market policy. It starts in the middle of the 1990s with the OECD uh, paper. It uh, goes on with the open method of coordination and it's a kind of naming, shaming and blaming. Yeah? Uh, like the way, uh, look at Denmark. The labor market policy works good because they have only a low unemployment. What do they do? Why do other countries not use those instruments? That's the normal way uh, these employment strategy works. And uh, the idea of this employment strategy is a special kind of flexibility which should uh, work all over the countries. And that's a kind we, uh, <coughs> we name uh, external numerical flexibility. If we all talk, as I have uh, done it this morning, of flexible labor markets, it's the easiest way we mean uh, external numerical flexibility. What does it mean? That means we have flexibility over the labor market, between employers, between firms. We have a mobility of the employees from firm to firm. In most cases, it means that people get unemployed, that we do something that is called hire and fire. In America, the people go, and if they have no work in one firm, they have to leave, and they have to find another work in another firm. That's the easiest way, and the, we think of flexibility. And that's a very Anglo-Saxon way of flexibility. We know from the United States, we know from Great Britain, from Ireland, from Australia, and New Zealand. And what, that was the idea the European Union uh, wanted to bring to the member states since the last 20 years. A few of you knew the textbook of uh, Oliver Blanchard, Macroeconomics. Most of the uh, students of London knew, the, knew it, perhaps the other ones too. Oliver Blanchard is the uh, chief economist of the uh, International Monetary Fund and he uses the labor market model which is in most cases due to that uh, idea of flexibility. And if you look to that uh, point of numerical external flexibility, then it's a case here where you have a strong reaction in the employees and here, and which is not the case in that one. You see that there are different models, different ideas on flexibility all over the countries and uh, you can see that different ideas of labor market flexibility in the outcomes of the labor market and the hours per employee in the number of employees or in the number of unemployed people. And uh, um, the countries do not only one policy but the labor market policy is a very, very <coughs> broad field of very different instruments. No, that's only a picture with, uh, which you can have as an exhibition because of the different colors and so But uh, what we can see here is that we have uh, 
different different fields of the labor market policy. Here we have active labor market policy. Uh, we uh, have the field of early withdrawal that you go that you retire before you are at the uh, right age for it. We have the job protection. Uh, we have unemployment benefits. How many money do you get if you are unemployed instead of a wage? And how do you react because of that unemployment benefit to find a new job? That's the economic question behind it. Uh, labor taxation, how does it work that you have to pay for your um, social security system, for the general tax system, uh, and what does it mean for your uh, um, supply of working hours, <coughs> wage setting means, uh, who is responsible for wages? Are the, the individual workers or do we have unions? And at what level of the economy do unions um, look for wages on the firm level or on the, on the central level or so on? And what's with working time in case we already have? So you see that. Uh, Every group of countries we have here, the Nordic, the continental, Anglo-Saxon, Southern, Central, and Eastern, uh, uses all of these instruments in, a, in, a, in all of its possibilities and uh, with different uh, um, what what has changed in Germany very sharply is that uh, we have no early withdrawal. That was a very common instrument uh, till the end of the 90s. Uh, with a legal retirement age of 65, most of the men uh, retired with uh, 57 to 58. That was rather expensive for uh, the uh, retirement uh, institutions, and it was expensive for the countries, but uh, for, the, for the firms. But it was a kind of agreement uh, in within uh, the workers that it would be a nice system. And uh, if I look at my age, I would say okay. In a few years, if I can go, if I can retire, that would be um, very fine. But if you look at the whole economy, the whole society, and the demographic uh, change in all those countries, nobody knows how to pay for that system. And uh, even if you need the human capital that elderly workers have. It is uh, no good way to to uh, retire them early. So you see that there is a, a rather thick uh, distribution of possibilities, and uh, all over the European countries. And you see that here you have many reforms due to the uh, several labor market policies. And uh, over those 10 years, uh, the biggest part is the green one, the active labor market policy. And uh, here you can see that uh, job protection, uh, you have uh, many reforms over the years. And this one is labor taxation and unemployment benefits. It's not so big. In Germany, you have uh, so-called hard laws, uh, which um, create many demonstrations with them because they shortened uh, 
the unemployment benefits in a very sharp way. And this is what happened in many of the EU member countries. So that uh, the governments force um, the unemployment uh, back to the labor market. Now that's uh, a kind of development you can say that is uh, due to the numerical uh, external flexibility. If the people get unemployed, uh, we have to shorten them the unemployment benefits so that they go back to work and take uh, every work they can find so that they are uh, integrated in what way ever in the labor market. Let's see. Um, the mainstream of the labor market policy reforms over the last 15 years all over Europe due to that uh, European employment strategy. If, if you look to that picture, you can see that uh, against this European employment uh, strategy, the countries have used all of the instruments that have all over the all over the place. Uh, to a certain extent in, uh, in the way the European employment strategy uh, wanted them to work and to another way uh, against it. So it's not quite clear whether this European employment strategy has worked at all. So what ha has happened in the structure of uh, the demand of human capital in, during the crisis. And that's a very interesting development. You can see that, uh, or the other way around, uh, first we have white color workers and blue color workers. Do you know what the difference is between them? Yes. White color. Normally, we are all white color workers, yeah? and uh, we don't. Uh, and then we have both categories: high skill and low skill workers. And here we have the different uh, sectors where they are working: manufacturing, public services, private services, retail, construction. And what has happened over the last year? 2011 to 2012 is that the demand for labor boosts in the high skill sector in white color and uh, the blue color, blue color uh, workers lost many jobs not only in the low skill uh, segment but also in the high skill segment. <coughs> Um, so the, the crisis we've seen um, leads to a sharpening of the um, change in employment which we've seen over the last 20 years. Uh, change in employment, more white color and blue color workers, uh, more public and private services and manufacturing, more high-skilled than low-skilled workers. And that has been sharpened over the last year as the economy recovers and uh, um, we got new um, employment possibilities. So people with the low human capital are the losers if you want so, of the last crisis in labor markets. And uh, you may be the winner in the next part. Yeah. <coughs> so another very fine picture from which you might see nothing. It's the same picture as we have seen now for each country. And 
this from a report I have brought with me. If you look to uh, development in, in European countries, you can look at European Jobs Monitor, Eurofound. It's a very good site and institution in uh, sitting in Dublin. And it's uh, not quite so official as the European Commission. So it's a little bit uh, more direct in its uh, results than uh, the papers from Brussels. And the idea was, do we have a polarization in the countries due to the upswing or not? And uh, we have three categories of countries, the ones upgrading that mean, oh, uh, first I have to say what you can see if you want to see them. Uh, these are the quintiles of income. That's the lowest quintile of income, the next one, and these are the highest income quintile. And uh, upgrading means that uh, over all these countries you have uh, more income over that time span of one year. In the upper uh, quintiles, and uh, here that does mean polarization that you have a decrease in the lower quintile, and uh, that would be, an, if you would like to say that, an ideal uh, situation. Uh, the lower quintile lose and the higher quintile gains. That would be uh, mean polarization and uh, in the Eastern European countries plus Italy and uh, all over that three countries nobody knows what happened here <laughs> due to that uh, upgrading polarization and downgrading. Um, you have um, the idea that all income groups lose in comparison to the time before 2011. Now it's a it's a little bit of uh, it's a little bit crude, but it's a new idea to look at the development of uh, labor markets due to the income possibilities of the uh, different groups of. Uh, of workers. And, and the idea behind it is uh, people who have um, good and high human capital earn more than people with low human capital. So if you say, like in Ireland, the people with uh, in the first winter um, increase their income, that means the people with the highest uh, um, human capital increase their income. That's the idea behind it.
tasks you have to do in the new job. Then uh, that yellow, yellow orange one is wage flexibility. That's the other way of flexibility economists refer. If the um, <coughs> economy grow, the wages have to grow, and if the economy struggles, wages should go back so that people do not lose their job. That's, uh, if you remember the two slides this uh, morning uh, about labor mobility and wage flexibility, uh, that's the idea behind it. What we do have additionally is those internal numerical and internal functional uh, flexibility that means uh, short-term work would be a kind of internal numerical flexibility. People stay within their job, within the firm, but they work uh, shorter hours than normal. And internal functional means that if uh, the working place uh, has gone, the employer finds a new job within the firm for the people. Um, and that would be the idea. Here you can see that the uh, structure of those different flexibility possibilities uh, over the country is very different. And uh, you have on the one hand Spain, which uh, has a very high percentage on external numerical and external functional flexibility. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have Denmark with a, a rather high part of those internal um, measures. Germany is here, and you can see also that Germany is dominated by internal flexibility and not so by uh, external ones. And uh, Poland is here, and if you take external and wage flexibility, so you see it's most of the flexibility that uh, belongs to the external part. Uh, what we can see is in general that the uh, different European member states uh, have a very different tradition in labor market policy. And that means that uh, what had happened in Germany over the last years, uh, strengthening of the external numerical and of the wage flexibility, has uh, um, brought many problems with us. Uh, and uh, the German economists discussed since um, five to six years whether it was good for the labor market or not. <laughs> I do not know it yet. The, these are only the, oh, perhaps the one thing which is, uh, which was very interesting for me, perhaps for you. Uh, I have this picture out of a, a paper from Eichhorst, Feil and Marx, and Eichhorst was one of the um, supporters, of the strong supporters of external numerical flexibility and of wage flexibility all over the last 10 years. Since uh, two years, he, you can found something like this here in, in his papers. And he said, oh, it's rather good. So he decided uh, to see more than external flexibility and look stronger at the internal possibilities we have to, to work with the labor force. And even the OECD has changed its position to that way. So that are only the definitions uh, you can have when you get the paper. And so I would 
come to my conclusions. Uh, we have very, very different reactions due to the prices and the actual situation. I think we have very different outcomes in terms of labor market performances, as you uh, could have seen. And uh, each country needs its own mix of labor market flexibility. It's not because the people are used to it. It's secondly because you need the labor market flexibility due to the production structure you have in each country. It's not a good way for a country like Germany with uh, a strong export sector with rather high technology products to hire and fire because the workers, uh, the firms need, uh, need themselves a high proportion of uh, human capital. They need to know the way the firms work and so on and uh, it's, it would not be a good idea to, to hire them if you have no, uh, nothing to produce in that moment. Now the question is, is that good or bad news for the European employment strategy? And the answer is, as usual, it depends. It depends on uh, whether you look in a more ideological or in a more pragmatic way on the European employment strategy. <coughs> if you are interested in uh, labor market development in, the, in Europe, you will find those labor market develop, development uh, reports uh, every year. This is uh, most of the pictures I have out of it's 2012 uh, on the slides of the European Commission. It's the um, General Direction 5, which uh, is due to economic and labor market problems. So I hope it was not too terrible for you, all the <laughs> data and so on, and uh, not very much written on the slides. And thank you very much. Now we have time for discussion, for comments on the presentation, for the question. Uh, very good question. It's, uh, 
It's a typical problem for international comparison. Um, we, in, if you look to unemployment rates, you have for each country almost always two different rates. You have the national rates due to the laws, to the labor laws, and you have one uh, for international comparison due to some conventions we have out of the ILO, the International Labor Office in Geneva. And uh, the two are very different, the two rates. Because, um, let me give you the German example. Um, in Germany, you can, as an unemployed person, you can work up to 15 hours a week. Due to that um, um, measurement of unemployment rate for international comparison, you are not unemployed if you work one hour per week. That means that uh, the unemployment rates for the case of Germany differ for about three percentage points. In Sweden, one of those great welfare states, it's the other way around. The, the, um, the international uh, unemployment rate is about two percentages higher than the national. Now that's, uh, that's a problem we have, is measuring with these things. And I have told you before that I show you the unemployment rate and the employment rate because there is always something in between. Uh, in, in Germany, we uh, reformed the labor market policies over a few years, and in 2005, the unemployment figures uh, go up from, uh, from one day to the other. Um, uh, for about one million people. And that was only due to the change in labor law. And we have um, uh, one million people who, who didn't work at that time uh, declared to unemployed people. So that's a problem within it. And, uh, <coughs> I have colleagues who say, oh, don't look at the Eastern European states. All the figures are false. <laughs> but we have nothing better. Thanks. If I understand you correctly, um, necessary would be a um, country specific strategy. Um, how would you judge? The European Union approach. Uh, is, it, is it compatible with this one or is it more strategy like a one size fits all? Yeah, it's more strategy like a one size fits all. Um, that's a big problem. And I hope that the um, labor market reactions due to the crisis show the Commission that uh, we have. Uh, much more to look at the individual problems from country to country. Because uh, if you think uh, on the lecture this morning, we have several institutional settings. Or if uh, I go here, we have several fields of labor market policy. And you cannot say, oh, Let's take the early withdrawal without doing something, uh, um, without changing other policy fields. And, and that's the way the, the European employment strategy works. They say, oh, Denmark has no job protection. <coughs> so, why have the German one? But Denmark has no job protection with high unemployment benefits in combination. So I have always to ask what 
what's the combinations of the different instruments and how do they work in combination and not alone. And uh, at the moment they are thinking about this combination. It's not so, so on a low level like the years before. We mean that, sorry, we mean that European employment strategy doesn't make only limited sense. Because the conditions are so different that you cannot have one strategy, so they should better skip it. Mm, no, no. <laughs> because uh, um, they give us pressure to think about our systems and to think about how they can work better. And that's a, a good part of the European employment strategy. And the not so good part is that they wanted us to say what is the right way. So if it was too much now, uh, it's okay. Uh, I'm here all over the day, all over tomorrow, even if we have to stay up early tomorrow morning because of us. And uh, you can come to me and ask the questions you have uh, on labor market policy. Okay, yes. Today and tomorrow. As uh, lucky internet owners, you will have the, the presentation, so you may become much more familiar with this data. So tomorrow, uh, at early, uh, during, during the trip to Rosen, you will have uh, the opportunity to discuss all this data and, uh, and the contribution. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for today, and, and uh, let's, let's meet tomorrow.